Sandra Rigdon, daughter of Eldridge Bowles, Seaman First Class, lost at sea. Today, I am my father's voice. My daughter was born May 16, 1945. I am so happy to be at home on leave to hold her while she sleeps. I am so proud to be the father of a little girl. You know how much fathers love and adore little girls. We've gotten a call to hurry back to our ship. Knowing I must leave, my family is causing me to be depressed. I tell my mother I have a feeling I won't be coming home this time. Hello, my name is David Doherty. I am the nephew of David Lowell Driscoll, his namesake. My name is David Lowell Driscoll, and I was born March 3, 1918, in Leeds, South Dakota. I was the second son of Robert E. Driscoll and Mary Louise Farron Driscoll. My father was president and owner of the First National Bank of the Black Hills in Leeds, and he also owned banks in ten surrounding communities. My father loved the Black Hills and was a prominent business leader known to many as Mr. Black Hills. I was one of five children. I had an older brother, Robert E. Driscoll Jr., known as Bobby, and three sisters, Kathleen Evans, Mary Haig, and Josephine Doherty. Today, my only living sibling is Josephine, and she resides in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I graduated from Lead High School and later attended Harvard and UCLA. I was known to my friends and family as someone who was semi-shy, articulate, humorous, intelligent and humble. One of my talents was playing the piano. I was a concert pianist but also loved to play and entertain for my friends and family. I once was offered $300 a week in Hollywood to play background music for movies, but declined as I was attending Harvard at the time. Today my sister Josephine still has my grand piano in her living room in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. In 1942 I graduated from the U.S. Navy Officers School and was assigned to the destroyer Phelps. I saw action in the Lewisian campaign, the attack on Guam, Midway, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. I was wounded in action and voluntarily returned to duty in 1944. My brother Bobby also served in the 5th Air Force in the Philippines area. He was shot down in September of 1944 in the New Guinea area. In 1945, I was deployed as communications officer on the USS Indianapolis, headed for Guam. I was reported missing in action in the, in the Pacific on July 30th, according to a telegram received by my parents from the Navy in August of 1945. They say the last words from the communications office was, my God, let's get out of here. My family likes to believe that could have been me. The Driscoll family was devastated at the loss of my life, but also the loss of so many brave men in July of 1945. God bless all who lost their lives on the USS Indianapolis and to those living today that are the reminders of our brave military that fought for our freedom in World War II. Good morning. My name is Leslie Stute. I am great niece, and this is my dad, Richard Eugene Jury, nephew to Richard Eugene Jury, who lost his voice on July 30, 1945. These are the telegrams his parents received. The first telegram, August 13, 1945. Mr. and Mrs. Harry Jury, Kalamazoo, Michigan. I deeply regret to inform you that your son, Richard Eugene Jury, Seaman Second Class, is missing in action, July 30, 1945 in the service of his country. Your great anxiety is appreciated and you will be furnished details when received. To prevent possible aid to our enemies, please do not divulge the name of his ship or station unless the general circumstances are made public in news stories. Vice Admiral Randall Jacobs, the Chief of Naval Personnel. The second telegram, September 18, 1945. Mr. and Mrs. Harry Jury, Kalamazoo, Michigan. I deeply regret to inform you that a careful review of all facts available related to the disappearance of your son, Richard Eugene Jury, Seaman Second Class, previously reported missing, 
leads to the conclusion that there is no hope for his survival and that he lost his life as a result of enemy action on July 30, 1945, while in the service of his country. If further details are received, they will be forwarded to you promptly. Sincerest sympathy is extended to you in your great loss. Vice Admiral Louis E. Denfeld, the Chief of Naval Personnel. My name is Michael William Emery. I am the nephew and namesake of William Friend Emery, Seaman First Class, Quartermaster Striker, Navigation Division, USS Indianapolis, Lost at Sea, Gone But Never Forgotten. I am the voice of my uncle. Dear Graham and Pop, well, I've been a very bad letter writer lately, but I have just been too busy to get anything done. I am at home today winding up 15 days leave, which I spent all the way across the country in Connecticut. I had a swell time with my girl and all the people and was lucky enough to be able to fly back in 11 hours. It was a swell trip. As you can see from the address above, I am now on the Indianapolis and she is a swell ship. She is now in for repairs, but I expect we'll be going out in a week or two. But we have a swell bunch of guys on board and I'm looking forward to the voyage. I wonder if you could do me a big favor. Mother tells me that my strong box was sent to your place with the other stuff that was sent there. Well, I am enclosing the key to the box and if you will open it, you will find in there a little blue ring box with a ring in it. I bought the ring some time ago to give to my girl when I went away and I want her to have it now. So if you will mail it to her, I would appreciate it very, very much. Her address is Miss Ann Jackson, Canoe Hill Road, New Canaan, Connecticut. Then you can mail the key back here, and I'll get in some time. Anne is expecting the ring, so you don't have to put in any note. Thanks a million. Well, that is all the news for now, but I will try to write sooner next time. Love to all, Bill. P.S. I almost forgot the re main reason for this letter, and that was to thank you for the war bond for my birthday. It sure was swell of you to do that, and it will come in very handy after the war. Thanks a lot, Bill. My name is uh, Earl Henry Jr. I am the son of Lieutenant Commander Earl Henry, the dentist on the USS Indianapolis. He was lost at sea. Um, I am going to sp speak for uh, his voice um, by reading the last letter that he sent to my mother. It's dated July 26, which was uh, right after he had gotten mail at Tinian, where the Indianapolis delivered the atomic bomb. Uh, this was mailed two days later from Guam, the last port that the Indianapolis departed from. So now this is the voice of my father. Thursday night, dearest Jane Gal, Baby Angel, those two wonderful pictures came today and I am delighted as can be over them. Considering that he is a premature baby, he looks mighty good. As Lou Haynes remarked, all prematures look like the wrath of God. But he looks good. Now in parenthesis, my father wrote, Lou didn't say that in reference to the picture. He said it a few days ago when I was telling him about your thinking that Earl's legs were so thin. He thought our baby looked grand, and so did Mel. Angel, I'm really gone on those pictures, and I tell you, their value to me lies as much in the fact that I got a wonderful picture of you as it does getting a good picture of our sassy little boy. For honestly, it is the most natural picture I have ever seen of you, and I love the setting. Thanks a million for sending them, and being so dang smart as to have them made early. Oh, happy day. Must close, sweet ones. Love to all. Earl. Good afternoon. This is Jeff Sweeney. My great uncle, Wallace Jeffels, lost at sea July 30th, 1945. This personal letter was sent to his brother, my grandfather, Sam Jeffels, on February 4th, 1945. Dear brother, Received your letter yesterday. I am glad to hear everything is okay. This leaves me in pretty good health so far. Glad to hear that you and the rest are still working. 
I am glad to hear that Bill is walking and hope he will keep it up and doesn't get into the service. Tom must have a pretty, pretty good job if he is walking on the railroad. Sorry to hear that Warren got hurt again. I think it's about time he was getting to come home again after we won't be able to dodge them always. I hope, I hope you can get your business started some way and that you can make it out some way. I had my insurance made out to you so, so you will collect if anything happens to me. You, hap, you treated me decent when I was back there, so I figured I owe you something and I figured you could use it someday. I hope you never get it as I would like to come back and stay a while after the war. I never heard from Shirley. I don't know what she intends to do. Tell Elma hello from me. Tell Dad I received his letter and be sure to let him know when he gets the other money order. I will close for now, hoping this finds all of you in the best of health. Your brother, Wally. I'm David Kincaid, nephew of Joseph Ursel Kincaid, lost at sea. He composed a uh, letter written to his cousin Ruth, July 4th, 1943. The letter states, Dear Ruth, here it is, the 4th of July, and I am doing the same as every other day. I suppose most people in the States are celebrating to a certain extent. If I was home, I would be. I am just back from Chow, and it sure was swell. They gave us cigarettes and a cigar. It sure is nice being in the Navy instead of the Army, after seeing what the fellows have in the Army. I wrote Irene a letter this morning. She sure is good in writing to me. She is, or was, staying with Mother. Have you seen Mother, or any of the rest of the family? Charles was home about three weeks ago. It sure is nice he is stationed so near home. I only wish I was stationed somewhere in the States. Yesterday I saw a couple of wildflowers. Amazing. Do you ever see Katie Henchman? I used to write to her when I was in Chicago. It was quite a correspondence, but for some reason it ended. If you see her, Tell her I said hello. Tell your mother I sure would love to drink a cup of coffee with her. Maybe I can someday. Keep everything going on the home front, and we will keep everything under control out here. As ever, Joseph E. Kincaid, S1 class. My cousin Ruth wrote a home approximately a month after the sinking of the Indianapolis. I can't express my sorrow on the day the news flashed out of the fated Indianapolis that was lost beyond a doubt. Just to think of all the parents and the friends of those on board, how their hearts ached as they listened for just one consoling word. Oh, I would that I could comfort mothers, fathers, friends, and wives of the sons who, fighting bravely for our nation, gave their lives. But it seems we all are powerless, and the most that I can say to the friends of those who are missing, let us still have hope and pray that the next news will be better, that they finally will be found, and that God will will now protect them that they'll soon be homeward bound. They were still in hopes that they would be found. Five years later, she wrote this in memory of Ursel. Five years have passed since Ursel went away, but his memory lingers with us day by day, and we know he's only sleeping, resting now forevermore waiting for his friends to greet him on that other peaceful shore. He gave his life, like many others, that we might have freedom here. Though his place at home is vacant, within our hearts he's ever near. 
May God give us grace sufficient to ease our aching hearts and help us prepare to meet him where loved ones never part. Good morning. I'm Judy Luker, niece of Lost C. Claude Luttrell Coxon. Today I am the voice of my uncle who was 19 years old when the Indy was sunk. This is from the last letter my mother received from Uncle Claude, dated July 10th, 1945. I'm so sorry I'm late in writing, sis. I've been so busy this last week, I haven't written anyone. We have been bringing on stores and ammunition and getting ready to leave. I have left Mare Island and I'm at Hunter's Point. I expect to leave the States the 20th unless something goes wrong. That's what we're going to find out today. We're on a trial run. We were doing 32 knots this morning and this thing rattled like a Model T Ford. Then written a bit later, well, sis, we're leaving the States the 16th of July. We're going from here to Pearl Harbor. From there, I don't know where. I bought myself a real pretty ring last night. It's made of steel with a mother of pearl in it. Well, Thelma, I must write to mother so I will close. Give my love to all and write soon. As ever, Claude. I'm Thomas David Medcalf, nephew of Lost to Sea Gunner's Mate. Third class, Petty Officer David William Medcalf. I will be his voice today. There's an old saying that as you're dying, your life will flash before you. My life of 30 years was suddenly at that point this early July morning in the Philippine Sea when a torpedo ripped my ship, the USS Indianapolis, in two. I did not feel the cold, dark water as it rushed over my body. I was back on the family farm in rural Gallia County, Ohio with my loving parents, Walter and Hollis Reese Metcalf, playing with my sister, Vera, and my brother, David. I moved quickly through my young years, through the college years, and relived my marriage with a few short years with my wife, Esther Wilker Metcalf. I again witnessed the, my father's death and the birth of my niece, Phyllis, and my nephew, Thomas, my brothers, Lester's children that I am starting to love. I began to feel the cold water again as my body began to sink helplessly into the sea. I can only pray that this secret mission that has taken my life and the life of my shipmates will save the many live ones I am leaving behind. I am Burl Neal, nephew of Lost of Sea. Charles Keith Neal, known to the family as Keith, writes to one of four brothers in the military at that time. Ralph was the oldest and served as crew chief in the Army Air Corps. I will be reading a few lines from two writings, the first postmarked February the 24th, 1945, the other July 3rd, 1945. I am the voice of Charles Keith, Neil. Dear Ralph, I thought I would write a little. I'm in the Navy now. It's a lot of fun, but they work you all the time. I've been here one week now, how are you making it? I doubt if you can read this because we just got up. It's about 5.30 a.m. now. I'm hungry as I can be. They just called chow. So I better go. So long. Your brother Keith. Dear Ralph, Well, how is the world treating you? Have you been very busy lately? I've been working kind of hard. But it will really be hard pretty soon now. I got a couple letters from Mom last week and she said that dad might go back to work. Do you remember Louise Hema? Well, she's a good looking girl and she has a grown up a lot. Well, Ralph, I guess I'd better close for now, so don't forget to write. Good luck, Keith. Today, I am the voice of my uncle, Theodore Jean Ott, Yeoman First Class. I was born in March of 1924 my two-year-old brother could not say Theodore Jean, so he called me Dini, which was the name my family and friends called me from that point on. As a very young boy from Eddyville, Iowa, I had three dreams in life. My first dream was to become a sailor in the Navy. My second dream was to marry my elementary school sweetheart by the name of Peggy. My third dream was to have children with Peggy. My family moved to Southern California before starting high school, where I met my best friend, David Singerman. 
When we graduated from high school in 1941, we both joined the Navy. Dream number one was fulfilled. While I was stationed in Hawaii, I met up with another friend who gave me contact information for Peggy, who still lived in Iowa. Ultimately, Peggy moved to Southern California and we got married in 1944. Dream number two was now fulfilled. David Singerman, who was a signal man on the USS Indianapolis, wanted me to join him on the ship. So the two best friends ended up on the Indy together. How wonderful that was for both of us. I am now the voice of Deanie's new bride, Peggy. In the month of July, 1945, I found out that I was three months pregnant with our first child. I wrote a letter to Deanie to tell him our exciting news. But sadly, the letter was returned unopened due to the tragic sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Deanie would never be aware that his third dream in life was about to come true. In February 1946, I gave birth to not one child, but twins, a girl, Peggy Jean, and a boy, Theodore Albert. Though Deanie was the biological father of his twins, he would never know the joys of being a daddy to his children. Deanie's legacy will live on through his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Ultimately, I guess you could say that his three dreams in life were fulfilled. Today, I'm the voice of Father Thomas M. Conway, chaplain of the USS Indianapolis, reading the letter I will be sending to the family of Earl Prosai, one of the nine young men killed by the kamikaze attack on our ship. USS Indianapolis, 10 April 1945. Mr. Anthony Prosai, 211 Ninth Avenue Northeast, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dear Mr. Prosai, the Navy Department has already informed you that your son, Earl Peter Prosai, was killed in action on the morning of the 31st of March. It is my sad duty to add to this brief statement whatever details military security allows and to give you my sincere sympathy on the loss of your boy. The blow which struck your son killed him instantly. As soon as he was hit, two men carried him out of the damaged compartment. Our doctors examined him at once, <clears throat> but he was beyond any assistance they could give. We carried his body down to the sick bay, encased it in a canvas burial shroud, and then placed it in a wooden coffin. We buried him that afternoon. His flag-draped coffin was placed on the quarter deck and in the presence of Admiral R.A. Spruance, commander of the 5th Fleet, his staff, and the entire ship's company, I read the prayers over him. Six men from his division acted as bearers. They were Jimmy Wakefield, Seaman Second Class of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Fred Harrison of Waterbury, Connecticut, Jimmy French, Seaman First Class of San Francisco, California, Vincent Allard, Quartermaster Third Class of Omak, Washington, Robert Owens, Quartermaster Third Class of Kingsport, Tennessee, and William Burt of Boise, Idaho. They carried him into a small boat alongside. The Marine Firing Squad fired three volleys and the ship's bugler sounded taps. We buried him in the American cemetery on one of the small islands of the Pacific. The flag which draped his coffin is being sent to you and you should receive it soon. Your son was one of the most well-liked and respected men aboard this ship. Everyone from the commanding officer down to the men in his division thought and spoke very highly of him. He was always cheerful and willing and devoted to his duties and we will miss him very much. Our loss, however, will be small compared to the loss you will feel at losing such a wonderful boy. His country is proud of him and she'll never forget what he has contributed to her. The memory of his courageous sacrifice will never fade and to us who knew him, it shall ever be an inspiration and an encouragement to carry on the work that still must be done. I hope you will find some consolation in the thought that when this war shall end and peace and happiness will once more come to the world, you will remember that you, before others, have paid the greatest price anyone could pay.
for you have given your Son, and no one can do more than this. I pray and hope that Almighty God, in his goodness, will give you the strength to bear up under this severe loss, and I know that he will be most generous with you who have been so generous with others. May he help and bless you and your family. Sincerely, Thomas M. Conway, Chaplain, United States Navy Reserve. I am Thomas Roten, brother of Roy Edward Roten, fireman second class who was lost at sea. Today, I'm his voice. I was born in November 3, 1926 on a farm north of Modale, Iowa. Like many students, I farmed during my high school years, graduating from Magnolia High School in May of 1944. Eight months later, in January of 1945, I received my draft notice to report for the draft. I was given a choice of the Army or Navy. I chose the Navy because I had an older brother in the Navy at the time. After finishing boot camp at Great Lakes in May of 45, I was sent to Merrick Island, California to join the USS Indianapolis. With the sinking of the ship, I had been, only been in the Navy six months. My name is Julie Rutherford Haas, niece of Lost at Sea, Robert Arnold Rutherford, Radio Man 2, better known as Red. This letter is written July 13, 1945. My dearest folks, just thought I'd better write you a letter as you might have given me up for lost. Well, I'm not quite lost yet. Well, anyway, here comes one of my short scripts. Hoping it reaches you to find everything back that way okay. I am still in the States, but it's very hard telling how long we will be here after I write this letter. In fact, I don't know if we will be over a week at the most. From here, it's hard telling where we will go, but I have a faint idea. Well, to see Bud again, possibly, that is, of course, he hasn't come back to the States before I get out there. You tell Carol Ann that I had a dream the other night. I dreamed I was home and she was getting me up like she did a long time ago. You wake up, you old redhead. I'm sitting here with a pair of headphones on, listening to the music and writing a letter. It's about 11 o'clock in the evening. I slept all day, almost, Ma, and I'm not a bit tired. You will have to pardon this letter as it's typed, but I lost my pen and I had to buy another. The next one will be long-handed. Well, how are the kids doing with their new vacation? You behave and have a hard time, I bet, keeping track of those two kids, especially Fritz and Newser. Guess they are gone every minute of the day. Sissy is helping you too with the housework, but at least you will have little red to keep you busy. Well, Mom, I guess that just about takes care of all. The details here are so hard, and I better close right now. So I hope to hear from you real soon. So, I say cheerio with all my love and kisses to the ones I love most in this cruel world. So until then, may God bless all of you and keep you all safe. Bye for now. We'll write again in a couple of days as your loving son, Bobby. Hello, my name is Cindy Wilson, niece of William G. Steer, Seaman First Class. I am going to read a letter that Cletus LeBeau, a survivor, wrote to our family after the sinking of the ship. Dear Miss McGinnis, I received your letter yesterday. I am sorry your nephew was one of the many who did not survive the sinking of the ship. Yes, I knew him. He came aboard in May or June, and we called him Reds. He was very well liked by me and the other guys. We worked together a lot, and he was a swell guy. I am sorry I do not know where Steer was at the time we were hit. None of the divisions saw him in the water nor on the ship afterwards. It is my belief that he was asleep in one of the forward compartments and never knew anything of it for he would have died instantly without any suffering. My deepest sympathy to your family and to all those who lost loved ones in the tragedy. 
Personally, I cannot believe it was any part of our skipper's fault. He was just following orders. I believe he will be acquitted of all the blame, and I know he should be. It couldn't have been anyone's fault. He did all he could do for us after the ship was lost. I am sorry, and I hope it helps to know that William died without suffering. Severely, Cletus. I would like to thank Cletus LeBeau and his family for the time that they spent with me last year at last year's reunion, reminiscing, reading letters about my uncle, Steer. I am Steve Brantley, nephew of Chief Warrant Officer Leonard Thomas Woods, lost at sea. Today I am the voice of Chief Warrant Officer Woods. I joined the Navy at 17 in 1934 signed in by my widowed mother, whose husband and my daddy fought in World War I and probably died as a result of. I was assigned on numerous ships with various duties. On 3 December 1941, while assigned to the USS West Virginia based at Pearl Harbor, my enlistment was up. I re-enlisted on 4 December 1941 as I planned to make a career of the Navy. On 7 December 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Imperial Japanese Air Force and Navy. My ship was anchored directly behind the USS Arizona. After seven torpedo and bomb hits and with the burning oil fires from the Arizona, the West Virginia settled to the bottom. I survived this to be assigned to the USS Indianapolis in 1944 as Chief Warrant Officer in charge of radio communications. On the night of 30 July 1945, the ship was hit by two torpedoes and sinking fast. I was burned and covered with soot, but I made my way through darkness to the radio room, which still had power, to send SOS messages. When the ship listed over, I ordered my men to abandon ship and continued sending SOS messages. I am now the voice of Ada Melba Brantley Woods also known as Aunt Sister to my nieces and nephews. I met you in school. We lived only a few miles apart in Wrightsville, Georgia. After courtship, we married in 1943 and immediately left for Washington, D.C. for training and honeymooning, of course. On completion of this assignment, I followed you on to Long Beach, California, as you would be assigned to the USS Indianapolis in 1944. You then deployed to the far Pacific, later returning to California on board the battle-damaged ship in 1945 for repairs. We were able to spend lots of time together, and it was the happiest time of my life. I became pregnant with your child. Our time together quickly came to an end as your leave was suddenly canceled, and you were recalled to the ship for deployment in mid-July 1945 on what we now know was a war-ending historic mission. I anxiously waited and hoped for your soon return as we felt the war would soon be over and we would begin the rest of our lives together. On 13 August, I received the following telegram. I deeply regret to inform you that your husband, Leonard Thomas Woods, Chief Warrant Officer, United States Navy, is missing in action 30 July 1945 in the service of his country. Your great anxiety is appreciated and you will be furnished with details when received. To prevent further possible aid to our enemies, please do not divulge the name of his ship or station unless the general circumstances are made public in news stories. Two days later, the official announcement of the end of the war came. I was completely devastated and heartbroken, Mr. Leonard. I am sorry to inform you that I lost our child to miscarriage due to my grief. On 5 September, the Navy issued me orders and a ticket to board a train to Los Angeles and on to Macon, Georgia. Eventually, your status changed from missing in action to killed in action. I lived the rest of my life in Macon alone, working some as I was able. I never fully recovered from my loss. I wished you had lived. My life would have been so different and happy and I would have made a few, would not have made a few poor choices. I never remarried Leonard as I couldn't find anyone that could take your place.
I am Lynn Sparks. Today I'm the voice of Esther Kirk, mother of Lost at Sea, James Roy Kirk, seaman third class, my great uncle. His mother called her son Jim. Jim, son, you joined the Navy on Declaration Day, May 31st, 1943. You left for Great Lakes for training. You were home on furlough on July 22nd and went back on Saturday, July 31st. You were only home for nine days. On Tuesday, August the 3rd, you were shipped out to Pleasant View, California. On September 3rd, 1943, you boarded the USS Indianapolis. I prayed this was a good ship. I heard that it had been in several battles. I prayed again. You telephoned us on New Year's Eve on December 30th from California at 6.30 p.m. On January the 2nd, your ship landed in Pearl Harbor. I am not clear, but I wrote down that you were in the Marshall Islands and then back to San Francisco and then back to Pearl Harbor. I may not have this right, but I am trying to keep up with you. After 15 months of sea duty, you came home on furlough for Thanksgiving, leaving again Saturday night at 9.45. Then I heard your ship suddenly left the States around July 16, 1945. I never heard from you again. Then the telegram arrived, and the rest of my life I was very bitter. I never talked about this tragedy. Relationships with my family suffered. My hurt was my hurt was lifelong. I never got to say goodbye. My name is Kathy Roth and I'm a friend of the USS Indianapolis Survivors Organization. I'm the voice of Elvin C. Malone, Seaman First Class. I was standing at gun watch with Luther Doyle Polk, Seaman Second Class, when the torpedoes hit. Since then, everything has been surreal. In my thoughts, I'm back home in Mississippi with my folks and all the good times we had. I think of my wife, Jewel, and how beautiful she looked on that June afternoon in 43 when we were married. I don't think I could love anyone like I love her. I still can see the fear in her pretty blue eyes when we received my induction orders and February 24th sure came fast. I doubt Mama and Daddy slept much when I left now that all six of us boys are in the service. It sure was cold in Great Lakes, Illinois, and we never had snow like that in Mississippi. I couldn't wait to leave that place. Jewel looked so beautiful when I went home on leave that April. Our baby Martha Ann was due in July, and Jewel was really looking like a mother-to-be. That makes me smile even now. I was already on the Indy when my baby girl was born, but I took leave in October and went home to see her and Jewel. It was a good visit with all my family, but not as good as the leave I took this past May after we were hit by the kamikaze plane. Mississippi never looked so good and neither did my Jewel, and oh the twinkle in my little Martha Ann's eyes. I really think she's the prettiest little girl to ever be born. I tried so hard to get her to walk while I was there but time ran out and I had to get back to the ship. I was so thankful Jewel was able to spend those five and a half weeks in California with me while the ship was being repaired. We had such a good time. It hurt to see her leave on July 13th, but she needed to be at home with Martha Ann and I would be soon deployed. My baby girl's first birthday was the 16th, the same day we pulled out with that secret cargo. And now here I am, two weeks later in the dark water. This is the third night and no one has found us yet. I wonder if they will. I'm fearful out here, though I'm not afraid of death, for I have Christ as my savior. But what will become of my jewel and our little Martha Ann? Oh, if I could just hold them one more time, I'd never let them go. I fear I will never have the chance. Polk and I made a pact. If he survives this and I don't, he promised to write my jewel and tell her I said, I'm not too good to die for my country, and I love you with all my heart and hope to meet you where there is no parting. 
I'm the voice of Jewel Malone Smith. I don't think I have ever hurt any more than I did in August 1945 when I received that horrible telegram. I wrote letters to everyone trying to find you, Elvin, but of course I didn't. Your friend Paul wrote to me that November and told me what you said and that he was with you the whole time until you died. My heart hurt so badly, but I am thankful to know the truth. When Anne was three years old, the Lord gave me a man to love us. He took good care of us and raised Anne as if she was his own. You would be proud of the woman your little girl became. She married and gave us four grandchildren, who gave us great-grandchildren, that gave us great-great-grandchildren. We had a good life, 68 years, but my husband died in 2014 and I in 2017. I love my husband faithfully, but I must admit, Elvin, there has always been a place, piece of my heart only reserved for you. Good morning, I'm Marilyn Henry. Today I share the memories of Agnes Phillips Boggs, older sister of Alton Newell Phillips, lost at sea. I was 103 years old when I died May 16, 2018. At the time of my death, it was believed that I was the oldest known sibling of a crew member of the Indianapolis. I wrote these memories of my younger brother a few months ago. I had the honor of representing my brother, Alton Newell Phillips, at the grand, as the Grand Marshal of the 2017 Veterans Day Parade in Jasper, Tennessee in May. I was only four years older than my brother, Alton Newell Phillips. Alton was born August 25, 1919, and was the third of four children born to Gideon and Mary Phillips of Jasper, Tennessee. Alton was one of five men from Marion County who lost their lives serving aboard the USS Indianapolis. He enlisted in the Navy February 25, 1944, and upon completion at the Great Lakes Boat Training Center, he was assigned to the ship in the spring of 1944. At the time of the sinking, he was married to Aileen with a three-year-old son, Alton Phillips, Jr. Prior to the war, Alton had attended a college at Tennessee Technical Institute where he had taken ROTC. Had he shared with the Navy of his ROTC experience, he would have entered the service at a higher rank, but he kept the information to himself, telling his family, I don't want any special treatment. At the time of the sinking, his rank was fireman, second class, and one of his duties was taking care of the ship's engine room. In a letter from Alton, written to me, dated May 19, 1945, Alton describes the events of the kamikaze attack that damaged the Indy. His letter reads, We were in Okinawa when we, we received our damage. One of those crazy Jap suicide planes hit us the 31st of March. It was carrying two 500-pound bombs. The bombs did not explode when they hit, or I do not guess I would be writing this letter today. Owensby and I were within 25 feet of it when it hit. One of them exploded two decks below in a fuel tank, and the other went all the way through the bottom before exploding. This event must have had a big effect on Alton's thinking, because during his last visit home, while the ship was being repaired, he told a friend, I won't be back. It was during this trip that he gave his mother a tiny metal ship. When Alton's mother passed away in 1980, this tiny ship was found in her belongings. She was a quilter, and she placed this memento in a small box alongside her mother's thimbles. Not many of her family knew of this keepsake treasure her son had given her. Before Alton's mother had learned her son was missing in action, she awoke with a start one night and bolted straight up in bed. It awakened Alton's dad who said, Mary, what's wrong? And to which she replied, Something's wrong with Alton. Later upon hearing her son was missing in action, she collapsed and was put to bed. Our family, like so many others, never learned what exactly happened to Alton. We were told he was supposed to be have been below deck, having just 
gone off duty at midnight. Of course, our family always hoped he was one of the initial 300 that went down with the ship. His dad never got over losing his son. He always wanted to go to California to look for him, but Alton's mother always discouraged him by saying, you won't find what you're looking for there, Gid. He never went to California, but died of a broken heart just four years later at the age of 65. And 70 years later, Alton's son said, Dad, if you had lived, I would have been a better man. Our family always believed Captain McVeigh was not at fault. I am the voice of the Indy Maru, reading a poem written about me by Father Thomas Conway. Stand by to man the golden gate and swing it open too, for standing in the bay today is the cruiser Indy Maru. Steaming along on two screws and a prayer, with half her boilers cold, the Indy Maru's been through the wars and looks a little old. She's hit the nip north and south, the mighty cruiser Indy Maru, at Tokyo and Iwo and Okinawa too. Through freezing cold and tropic heat and kamikazes too, nipping shells and bombs and fish has come the Indy Maru. So break out your blues and shine your shoes, the Indy Maru is here. They'll double the shore patrol and raise the price of beer. For months your wives have waited for the cruiser Indy Maru, so take along your dog tag to prove that you are you. Frisco's seen some great ships, but the greatest it ever knew is that tootin' shootin' cruiser, the fighting Indy Maru.